Welcome to today's video. Today we're going to talk about MongoDB and NoSQL databases. We're going to talk about what they are and how they're different from relational databases. So we're going to uh, assume that you already know some kind of relational database like MySQL. Not that you're going to need it, but just for comparison as an introduction. So we're going to go through what it is. We're going to go through the MongoDB basics. We're going to install it and start using it. We're going to talk about the Bison JSON format. We're going to talk about MQL or the MongoDB query language. And we're going to try and use MongoDB from the command line or terminal. And we're going to try and use it from a graphical user interface using MongoDB Compass. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, search. We're going to use all the CRUD functions in those two different setups. And we're going to move on into Node.js and just take a quick look at how to connect your MongoDB database with your Node.js application. So without further ado, let's jump right into NoSQL databases. So what is that? Well, NoSQL database is a non-relational database that doesn't use this uh, this traditional form of inserting data into rows and predefined columns. So what they're really good for is when you just want to collect a bunch of data and you don't want to spend the time setting up a proper data model for it. So there are definitely cases where you want to still use relational data models. And there are other cases where you just want to collect data and just keep collecting, 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 get all of the data in here. And then we can take a look at what exactly it is that we collected afterwards. It can be a really fast way to start up a project. And in certain projects, if this is really just something you use as a kickstart, you might even just use this as a, as a front loaded database where you then have some form of algorithm that would push your data over into a relational database afterwards, if you need that. Um, so, um, some of the key differences between NoSQL and relational databases is, of course, this tabular data model. You don't have that in a NoSQL database. Um, a NoSQL database is designed for scalability and performance, while relational databases are designed more for consistency and data integrity. So, um, so you might say that a relational database is built more for accuracy, while a NoSQL database uh, is built more for speed. A NoSQL database is also schema-less and have these flexible schemas, whereas relational databases have fixed schemas, once again, meaning that, that in a NoSQL database, you can toss whatever kind of data into it that you want, including files and all that kind of stuff, and you don't have to really consider how that data is structured, at least to begin with. Whereas in a relational database, you're a bit more limited and you need to know exactly where you're going to put things if you want to, <laughs> to save them in your database. Uh, and there are, of course, relational databases that uh, can handle files, but in many of them, you have to convert something into like a base64 blob, or you just have to put in a pointer to a file on disk or whatever. That's not the case with NoSQL databases. Um, so typically, um, NoSQL databases are really good at horizontal scaling, while relational databases are better at vertical, vertical scaling. And um, that means that vertical scaling, which is uh, what you would generally do to speed up your, your database in a um, relational database, that's when you simply just throw more CPU cores at the problem, right? If your database starts getting slow, toss more, uh, more memory in, so it gives it some more um, CPU performance. Um, horizontal scaling is where you can actually scale out and say, well, I don't want to toss another uh, set of RAM and another CPU into this computer. I just want to, to set up another computer with another instance of, this data, uh, instance of this database and then have them work together. That typically is a real headache with relational databases to have this mirroring of databases and try to, and try to uh, have data between them because, you know, once again, they're more about accuracy. So imagine a bank where you have two different versions of the database. It doesn't make any sense. I just withdrew a thousand bucks. How much money is, uh, is left on my account? Well, that depends. Am I asking the database that already knows this or the one that hasn't synchronized yet? So uh, these are, of course, the cases where you use a relational database and you wouldn't do this horizontal scaling. Um, but in these uh, databases where things 
don't need to be as accurate and you just need that speed, then maybe it does make sense to have multiple instances of the database uh, on multiple computers. Um, so when you are trying to consider whether to use a NoSQL database or a relational database, um, you need to, to basically consider is the is this system built for precision or for uh, or for speed? What's most important? And of course, speed is always important, but it's not always the most important. If you have a banking system, you'd still you'd rather have a slower, accurate banking system that you and then you would have a fast, inaccurate banking system. Um, whereas for other systems, it might be uh, it it might be you know um, less of a headache. If you're trying to build your own blog, well, maybe maybe it doesn't really matter if if people have the latest update to your blog post. Maybe some people won't get that latest update to the blog post for the next ten minutes until all of the versions of your database has has uh, synced or whatever it might be. Uh, the most important part is just that they get whatever data uh, seems to be the right data in an instance. Um, and of course, there's also the speed of development, right? So if you have a startup and you need to build some huge application and and uh, you end up with a bottleneck in designing your data model um, so that it can fit with every single use case that you wanted to work with in the future and figuring out what's the first step of the, this data model, this data model and how do you make it backwards compatible when you add more stuff to it? Well, you can kind of get out of those uh, headaches with NoSQL because you don't need to set up a data model. In NoSQL, you can simply install MongoDB and start throwing data at it, and it'll be saved, and you'll have it stored, and you can start doing um, math with it and, and and figuring out how all the data fits together after the fact. So it's a really great way to kickstart things. So just to get some examples of when you would use uh, something like a NoSQL database, in most generalized web applications, a NoSQL uh, database is fine because you want speed over accuracy. If you're doing real-time analytics, you'll need that speed. If you are doing big data processing and or social media, uh, a NoSQL database might be uh, a really good option. If you're doing something like a financial system or an e-commerce website, then you'll want to use a relational database because it's important if you have two or 10 t-shirts left when you're selling them, right? Uh, it's important that that uh, you get the right tax rates and, and that you have all of the financials in place and everything comes in in a sequential order. And you have so many things to keep track on just to make sure that you're upholding the laws within the confinements of your application. Uh, and the same goes for content management systems, enterprise resource planning or ERP systems, right? So with those kinds of systems, you'll probably still want to use a relational database. So. With all of that out of the way, let's talk about MongoDB and the MongoDB basics, right? So what is MongoDB? It's, an, it's a document-oriented NoSQL database that stores data as a BSON document in a collection. And you can see a collection kind of like a, a schema, or even if you're used to working with uh, MySQL, then, then you could almost see it as databases within the database management system. Um, and BSON is uh, a document type that's a lot like JSON, where JSON just stands for JavaScript uh, Object Notation. Um, BSON is uh, binary uh, encoded uh, instead of uh, JavaScript. Uh, MongoDB has this uh, flexible schema that we talked about, and it supports this horizontal scaling, and, and uh, it's possibly the most popular NoSQL database out there. So um, it has a, a bunch of great features, like it's open source, uh, um, it's a scalable, flexible, performant, it has dynamic schema, uh, all those great things. Um, and I really think we should probably just get to installing it and, um, and uh, try it out, right? So when we want to um, install MongoDB, there's a couple of things that we need to know and need to do. And there's, of course, a difference in whether you work on Windows or on Mac. So let's go through this. First of all, MongoDB Atlas is a 
cloud subscription service that they build, that they make their money from. So they are heavily trying to get to use that. And it's probably a great service, but that's not really what we're here for right now. So just keep that in mind as you go through the website because they push it a bit too hard. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment. So what you really want in here is you want to go to products and you want to go to community server if you want to get your, your free database. So if you're looking for a database, you might click here, but this is the Atlas database. That's not what you want. You want the community server if you want something on your own computer. And down here, and this is where it annoys me a bit, you know that, yes, MongoDB community server, MongoDB community server download, and uh, this is definitely what you want to do, and you can do these things. And then, you know, if you just look for the highlighted text, what you get is this, which is going to install MongoDB Atlas, which is definitely not what we clicked on. MongoDB Atlas is up here. It's a different service. It's a different thing. So yeah, great screenshot and, and great pushing, but it's not what we're here for. So what we want here is version, well, just select the current version in case you're not watching it uh, right after this video is made. You'll need to uh, click on your platform. Um, my platform happens to be macOS ARM64 because I have an M1 chip. And then there's this uh, TGC package. But if you're on a Mac like I am, don't download this. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you can do it, but it's, it, it's a bit odd, and I'll show you why. The reason I'm taking you in here is for the Windows, guys. If you are on Windows, scroll down to the bottom, click Windows, and pick MSI. That's a standard Microsoft installer. You can uh, pick it here, click Download, run it, and you have um, MongoDB running on your computer. It's not as simple for Mac OS. You can download it, but what you're going to have to do if you download it here is you're going to have to find the right path on your Mac and then uh, unzip this uh, zip file, because that's what it is. It's just a zip file. And you'll have to unzip that, rename the folder, and put it on the right path in your Mac. And then change a couple of configuration files to know to look at that path and set up that path for your terminal. It's, it's a bit of a mess, really. And what you want to do is probably more use something like Homebrew. So if you follow my PHP videos or my Node.js videos, you probably already have Homebrew. But just in case you don't, what you do is you go into brew.sh. And right here on the front page, and this is a bit odd because if you just uh, Google Homebrew, uh, then you can click on installation. But that's actually not going to help you install Homebrew. <laughs> You want to go back to the uh, to the front page instead, where you have this uh, command right here. You can click out here to copy it, and then you just jump on over into your terminal. And um, uh, let me just get a new terminal window here. And you just paste it in. You hit enter, and then it's going to install it. I'm not going to do it here because I already have it installed, but it's going to take some time, and then uh, you have that uh, installed. So. The next thing that you want to do after you install Homebrew is you want to use Homebrew to uh, to install MongoDB. And there's still, I know I said that it was a bit odd and a bit difficult before, but it still is. I mean, I, mean, I don't know why, but there's a couple of hoops to jump through for, for MongoDB to work. Because um, if you were to just say brew search uh, MongoDB, that's going to search Homebrew for MongoDB. And when I do it here, it uh, it shows me a lot of uh, MongoDB uh, things that I want. And this is what I want. But if you do the same right after installing Homebrew, it's not going to give you these results. It's only giving me these results because I tapped, uh, because I typed uh, brew tap MongoDB slash brew. After doing that, it's gonna, um, it's, it's gonna add. No mind. It's when I type this and I hit enter, it's going to add MongoDB onto, uh, into uh, the repository here. So that means that after that, I'm gonna be able to find MongoDB. If you just search for MongoDB like I just did, without doing this first, it's only gonna find MongoDB Atlas. So you have to do this. Then afterwards, you need to write brew update. Let me just hit uh, clear here. 
you need to uh, so you need to say brew tab mongodb forward slash brew hit enter i can do that here then you need to write brew update and it's updating it's getting the new information from uh, from various sources including mongodb and then when you write brew uh, search mongodb you'll get the results i just showed you and you can just write brew install mongodb uh, dash community and then you can hit enter i'm not going to do that because it takes a while uh, and i already have it installed here but that's what you need to do now this might fail and that's uh, just another hoop right because this is dependent on you having the latest command line tools on your Mac for Xcode. So if you don't have that, um, you'll need to install them. And just to make sure that you get the latest version, the simplest thing that you can do is to remove them, uh, to remove them if you already have them. So say sudo, so super user do, so do this as an admin, rm for remove. Uh, and then we're gonna add a couple of flags um, R for recursive, so remove the folder and every folder beneath it, and F for force, so don't ask me if I want to delete every single file, I do. Um, and then um, I need to add forward slash library, forward slash developer, forward slash command line tools. I need to remember the D. So. If I do this and I hit enter, it's gonna delete my command line tools. No worries about that. We're gonna install them in a moment. Once again, I'm not gonna do this because installing it took me somewhere around 10 minutes last time. So you need to be prepared for that. So after you did that command, you'll write sudo xcode dash select dash dash install. Once you hit enter, it's gonna install uh, the command line tools and there's space for it because the old version was removed. Uh, I mean, the folder is not taken up by an older version, so it can create that folder in the right place and it'll install everything. It's probably gonna take like 10 minutes, uh, maybe even more if you're on an older computer. But um, then after you did that, you can once again hit brew install mongodb-community hit enter and it's gonna install MongoDB community. And it should work now that you have the latest Xcode command line tools. And after that's installed, um, you can write brew services start mongodb forward slash brew forward slash uh, mongodb dash community. You can hit, hit enter. Now, it's going to complain here that it's already started elsewhere. Um, but uh, just to finish this off, because I do have it open in another terminal window. So after it's started, it's going to show you a different uh, uh, terminal. So you'll have to type in mongosh like this. And after you do that and hit enter, it's, um, it's going to actually start the, um, the command line tool for working with it. So mongosh like this. Now you can see that it says test out here, and that's the collection that we're in right now. And the interesting thing here is that I can say use and then the name of a collection, and that collection doesn't need to exist like at all. Um, so I can say, um, so I can say uh, show DBs, and this is gonna show me a couple of uh, weird files here, but uh, it has my test DB here, for instance. But I can say use um, Abra Cadabra, and I'm in a collection that's called Abra Cadabra now. Show DBs. It doesn't exist yet because there's no data in it, but um, um, but I I can just you know, uh, switch to databases like that. Now in here, I can say DB dot create collection and then say, um, abracadabra once again. Okay. So now we have a collection that's called that. Um, and then I can say DB 
dot abra cadabra dot insert one and then a parenthesis and inside that parenthesis i can use the bson format which for all intents and purposes is the same as, uh, as json right so i can write name colon uh, jack and h uh, colon 29. So I can see here that, that it acknowledges this new data and it's given it an object ID. Every single uh, entry that you make into the database gets an uh, object ID. So let's go through these uh, crowd operations, right? This was create, let's read something. So let's say, so let's say uh, db.abracadabra.find, there we go, and it finds one object because that's the object that we just created. Um, so that's read. Let's do an update. DB dot abra cadabra um, dot update one parenthesis again, and then in here we can um, we can find uh, the object that we're looking for. So we can say uh, name colon uh, Jack. And then we need a second uh, curly bracket here where we want to, to do something. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use a dollar sign set. So in MongoDB, you're going to find these uh, functionalities that are being set with a dollar sign. So that means that, that you're using a built-in function. So set colon, and then whenever you use those, you need to add a, um, an object after that. So that's why I'm using curly brackets again. And here I can say that H is now a 35. I'll hit enter. And once again, I can see here that it's been acknowledged. I can hit arrow up two times to find that, uh, that Jag is now 35 years old. Last uh, part of CRUD operations would be delete. So db.abracadabra.delete one. And in here, I still need my object and I'll say name colon uh, John and it'll search out uh, any data entries where this is true and it'll, uh, where this is true and it'll delete the first one. So there we go. Uh, deleted count one. Oh, he wasn't named John, he was named Jack. There we go. Deleted count one. And if I go back up to find, I'm going to find nothing because there's nothing left in the database now that I deleted it. So this is how you can work with the um, work with this in the um, in the command prompt. But generally, there is a way to get a better overview of this, and that's to use a, a graphical user interface. So let's jump on over into uh, MongoDB's website once again, look at products and let's go over here and look at tools and compass. So under compass, you simply say, uh, say download, and it's gonna take you down here to, uh, to the download section. And you just select the latest stable version. You need to pick your platform minus uh, an M1 chip on a Mac and packages a DMG. So you can download that. Um, and of course, if you're on Windows, uh, you just get an exe file that you can just run directly but i'm on a mac and when you open it here i get this uh this funny looking thing where i just take the mongodb compass app and then i can put it into my uh, applications folder now i don't want to do that because i already did that but that's how you do it and the first time that you run it you might want to right click on it when you right click on it hit the options button then you can see that the text text changes and then hit open because that way uh, you'll be prompted to uh, whether or not you want to open it. Otherwise, if uh, Mac doesn't want to open it, it'll just tell you that it doesn't trust the application and then force shut it again. Uh, this way you can force it open, but you should do that from within the applications folder after you move the file in there. So I'll just shut this down right now and jump over into that application and show you how it looks. Ta-da! Now I already have a bit of data in here. Uh, I have my collection here that I've been uh, playing around with for a little bit. So 
I already added a bit of data to it. And when you want to add some data in here, we just added uh, added uh, John before, but we can import directly from a JSON or a CSV file. So this is a really powerful tool that will allow you to get a lot of data into your database in a heartbeat. So what I will do here is when you open it, by the way, it's going to look uh, something like this. So let's just delete everything we have. So we have something clear to, uh, to work with here. No data, right? And let's reset the search query. There's nothing in this database. We're on the test DB and in um, my collection. And by the way, uh, Abracadabra exists up here. Uh, and there's also no data inside of that. So I can click here and I can say insert document. And you can see that it actually automatically um, inserts an ID for the document that we're about to uh, to upload or insert. And if I want to add something uh, like, you know, I can I need a comma to say that something new is happening. And then I can say name, colon, uh, I already had, no, I don't have anyone. So I can say that I have Jack here, who is um, of age 31. And I'll just uh, hit copy here. And it says that we have some arrows here, and I think it's the uh, single quotation marks here. There we go. So I'll copy it once again, copy and insert. And now we can see this data right here. I want to show you a couple of things. So I'll add some more data here. Uh, I'll insert a document once again. This time I'm going to remove this. Now, um, notice that this ends in 86. Now I'm going to remove it. I'm going to insert the same data that we had just before. I'm just going to remove that comma right there. So this is the exact same data that I just inserted, but it's getting a new ID. So a couple of things to notice. It's completely okay to have multiple objects that have the exact same data in them. Second thing, even though I removed the object ID when I insert, when I added the data, it was added anyway. And I wanted you to notice that the ID ended in 86. And that's because the first one up here had an ID that ends in 85. Then it generated an ID for me that ended in 86. Now I discarded that, I deleted that, but it still made me a new one. And the next one that it created ends in 87. So these are fourth running numbers, but you can skip some of them if you don't use them, but that's really how they're generated. It's not like some, some random UUID. It is uh, more like an auto increment, if you will. Now, Let's add a little bit of more data so we have something to work with, but I really think it's it's generally uh, cool to have um, these objects here that actually have the same data. So insert um, document, and I don't care if we keep this or delete this, it's gonna be fixed anyway. So I'll say we have a uh, Joe <laughs> name is uh, Joe. And then we have a uh, Joe's age is going to be 21. And then we could say, is Joe cool? Well, false. And I'm just using this to show you how to, how to use uh, strings, integers, and uh, booleans as examples of things that you can put into your data. I'm going to copy this just to make it easier for me to insert more things. And I'll add some more data, insert document. Um, here I'll say Jill is 46 and she is very cool. Insert. And then we have uh, a last one here. Uh, that was Jack, Joe, Jill. Let's do a Jane. And Jane is what? 32. And Jane is also Cool. Yes. Okay. So we have some different data here. Some of these data types are, um, are equal. Some of them are not. And if we go here into the table view, 
you can see that it actually recognizes that there are similarities between the data. So even though we don't have this strict data model that you know from a relation da relational database, it still recognizes that, well, these objects all have an ID, they all have a name, they all have an age. Some of them uh, have a, uh, a cool Boolean. One is false, two are true, and not, uh, two of them don't have a field here. And of course, I can edit, copy, delete, all of those things from right here. I can also jump into this middle tab here, which is gonna show me each of the objects in a JSON format. So uh, when I had this normal uh, notation here, if I wanted to copy something from here, I can do that by hitting the pencil and then I could copy it here. But this is not valid JSON. I couldn't copy this and then say add data and, um, and then insert it because I would have to add a bunch of things to that. So to so just cancel that, if I go over here, uh, I'll have that same data in a proper uh, object notation. And if I add data, insert a document, I can then use that. So um, it has to use like that. And I just add another entry with the exact same data because that's one of the beautiful things that you can do here. Um, you can do that in a relational database as well. It's not something I say as a differentiator. Um, so now that we have a bunch of data in here, we can of course uh, duplicate the data if we just want to, um, if we just want another copy of it that we can then change or whatever, and we can delete it here. So we can create and we can update, we can delete, uh, update, you simply do that here. Uh, Jack is no longer Jack, it's Jackie. There we go. Uh, if we want to change and say this age of 31, well, that's gonna be an integer of, uh, of 64 bits instead of 32. It's gonna be a double, it's gonna be a date, an array or whatever. One thing to note though is that if I change this into an array, it's gonna forget the value. It's not just gonna set it as the first value, it's just gonna forget that value. Uh, that's a bit uh, sad, but that's the way it is. I can hit cancel here and it's still gonna remember everything. So that's how you update. Uh, but we haven't actually looked too much at read yet because maybe I want to find only the only the people here who have an age of more than 32 or equal to, 40, to 32. So let's see, how can we do that? We could say that um, we want something where the name, uh, sorry, quotation marks, name, colon, and then uh, we need something in here where we can say that, um, well, actually we don't need something here. If we just want to say that the age is gonna be 32, we have one of those and I'll just hit enter to find. <laughs> age is gonna be 32, not the name. So we have one where the age is 32, but what if I want everyone where the uh, age is greater than 32? Well. I could say, uh, dollar sign, GT greater than, Um, age 32. Um, I think there's an error in this. Yes, there is. Age and uh, greater than. There we go. So now I'm finding everyone who is older than 32. And remember, 32 is not more than 32. So if you want greater than or equal to, we'll need to add an e to this. And once again, these are the built-in functions that we're using. We can also say, instead of uh, greater than, we can say uh, less than, uh, and then 42. So then we'll find uh, everyone except uh, uh, the one we had at, at 42. We have one here that's uh, 21. So let's say that we want everyone who is, um, 
Um, who is uh, less than 42 and older than 21. doesn't need to be separated there we go fine so now we have everyone who whose age is less than 42 and greater than 21 so that's um uh, that's read well what else could we do we could probably do something interesting with uh, the age let's see if we can find the um no i have one more thing that i want to show you here actually before we jump into aggregation so Right now, we're looking at the age. This is simple, right? What if we want every everyone who has um, JA in their name? Well, we might want to use regex for that. And regex is always uh, interesting to use. And if you don't understand regex, I have another video on the channel about that. Do yourself a favor if you're a programmer. No regex. Um, as in, you should know about regex, not, not as in no regex. I don't know if it sounded like that. Anyway, regex. And I don't want a regex on an integer. I want to look at the name. And here I'll say uh, anything that has an A in it. Find that. So that's uh, the same people. <laughs> what about anyone who has a J in their name? Well, that's all the people. That's the way I set up the names, right? Um, what do we have? We have a Jack uh, and we have a Jane. So we can say everyone who has a JA in their names. And we can use uh, every single bit of um, of um, uh, of regex in here. So I can say letters that go in a word and I want exactly four of those. Find then we have all the four little names, right? So we can use regex in a bunch of ways to find exactly the data that we're looking for. But I want to take this one step further. I want to go in here and I want to find what the average age of these people is. So I'll go into aggregations and I'll say create new and then I'll add a stage here and in here I'll say group. We can do a bunch of things here. There's so many things you should really look them through. I mean, for instance, we could use fill here to uh, to add uh, the cool Boolean to the users who don't have that. But right now I'm going to look at group and ID. I don't care about, I, about ID expression. Well, this is going to be the ID that um, that's going to help us um, um, do something uh, later on, but um, I'll just set it to null and then I'll say that I want uh, to set something called average age and I'll use uh, the built in average function here and I'll use that on uh, the age field. And that's going to tell me that the average age is 32. Um, that might very well be accurate. I'll just hit run and see here that it is 32. And just to make sure that it works, I can go back here um, and I can uh, change this age to 72. Hit update and um, that should massively impact this one. So now the average age is 36.3333 and a bunch of threes. So that's the aggregation pipeline. And when you want to work with the aggregation pipeline, um, you can, um, well, you can explain it actually and be told what it's called. You can export it uh, as JSON or CSV, the data that you're getting here. Uh, but you have the pipeline here and you can edit the pipeline. And the idea is that now we've defined the average age and we can then set another, set another stage after it where we can uh, add some more math to it or do something else with the data. So we can do this in multiple stages. Now I can take this uh, and let me just delete this stage right here. Uh, and I can take this one, uh, I can add a stage before or after, and I can go up here and say export to language. 
So I can export this directly into some node code if that's what I want. If I want to use some Java code, I can get that. If I want some PHP code, I can get that from right here. Um, so uh, I think this is really popular in the Mern stack, which is uh, MongoDB, Express, React, and uh, and Node.js. So you'll probably want to use this with uh, with Node, but you can use it with all of these if you want to. Um, and this is, of course, just a shell script from your from your own pipeline. So I'll hit close here. And the last um, thing that I want to show you is how to get this to work with uh, Node.js. So I've opened up uh, Visual Studio Code. And if I go up into, I'm sorry, but my menu bar is off screen. But if you go up into the, the top bar here and you say, um, uh, file, then you can say new window. Uh, and then I just dragged my folder Mongo node uh, into the workspace. And then I have that in a separate window. And then I can jump over into the terminal me menu and say new terminal. And that's going to bring up a terminal uh, console right here for me. And um, down here, I can do a bunch of um, <laughs> great things. So I can start installing um, installing uh, Node.js, for instance. So I can say npm init dash y. And that's going to create this package JSON file for me right here. And I can uh, move ahead from that and I can um, uh, install the things that I need, like um, like I can say npm i express mongoose um, and I think that's actually going to be enough for this. So it's going to install those things. <laughs> And of course, if you watched any of my videos in the past, then you know that the problem is that I need to write sudo first. There we go. It's going to install all the things that we need. So we get express, so we can do some kind of an API thing, just so we can call things. And then we uh, and then we need uh, mongoose, which is going to let us um, work with the MongoDB database. So I'll create a new file here. I'll call it app. Oh, let's let's try that again. New file app.js. And uh, in here, I'm going to write a const express equals require express const mongoose equals require mongoose. And um, let me then just uh, e initialize express. Yep. I'm going to say const app express and I'll want to use a, a port number as well. So const port equals process dot env dot port. And I want this on 3000. So then next up, let's uh, connect to MongoDB. Yep. That's exactly what I want to do. Uh, let's see what it has for us here. Uh, I'll use localhost 27017. That's the default port. And I'll want to use uh, Abra Cadabra. And let's see, I want to say um, use new URL parser. True. Use unified topology. True. Looks good. Then I will want to um, create a, a mongoose schema and model. So const const uh, abra cad abra schema equals new mongoose dot schema uh, and then a parenthesis here and semicolon. 
and then we'll add some schema definition in here. Uh, so I have a name, that's a string. I have an age, that's a number. And then I have uh, cool, which is a uh, Boolean. Uh, and it, it expected a comma right here. There we go. Then we have a const abra cadabra equals mongoose model abra cadabra abra cadabra schema. Yep. So let's create a get endpoint just to see if we can work with this. So uh, create get endpoint. There we go. So let's do app dot get, and we might as well just do forward slash, sure. Um, but I'll want to do this async, I think. Async, um, and let's finish this off just so we can see where we're at. And then in here, we'll say try, and we'll do a try catch. So we'll want to catch any error, and we'll just uh, want to. Um, to set a status 500 with this, um, because we want to work in JSON in general, right? So JSON, and in here we'll want a uh, JSON error message. So we'll say uh, error colon error dot message. There we go. And what exactly is it that we want to try then? Well, const entries equals awaits abracadabra dot find um, age colon and then we have this uh, gt um, is well not 20 let's set this to 31 so we can see that it's actually sorting out uh, some of the data and then response dot json entries and then, of course, we need to um, start the server here. So start the server, uh, app listen port, and yes, this should actually be fine. So I'll go down here and I'll say um, node app.js. It started the server on uh, port 3000. So let's go up here and say localhost colon 3000. And we're not getting anything. Now, the reason that I'm not seeing the data in my abracadabra collection inside the abracadabra um, database is that this is creating a model that's trying to follow this pattern. And generally when you work with models, it's pretty normal for the model to try and find uh, a collection that's, uh, that's named in the plural version of the singular you give the model as a name. So if you had a, uh, a user, co user collection, it would look for a collection that was actually called a users. And you probably know that uh, whole thing if you've ever worked with .NET, that's the same general uh, issue, right? So what we can do here is we can add a uh, another parameter here, a third parameter that gives the actual name of the collection. And we can uh, stop the server, we can start it again, we can go back here and we can refresh and we can see that now we're actually getting all of the data that we just worked with inside of uh, MongoDB Compass. And of course, we could go back in here and we could change the the, uh, the find statement here to, to something that says, well, we only want uh, the ones where the H is um, what could we say that the H was supposed to be um, and gt colon 31, hit save, go down here, stop the server, start the server, go up here and hit refresh. And now we only get these two 
where the age is higher than 31. Now we could of course move on and move ahead and and create a post endpoint that would allow us to enter data into this and and we could do all the CRUD operations once again. <clears throat> but I honestly don't think that's really necessary because there's a lot of tutorials on that. And if you just want that step-by-step -step on how to build a great uh, node application that works with MongoDB, there are, there are plenty of other videos for that. The whole point of this video was more to explain the concepts and show the different kind of ways to work with it. So what I'll do instead is I'll link a video right here that's going to show you, and it's going to be in the description below as well until I get the video links put up here. Um, but that's going to show you how to build a great um, MVC type application using uh, Node.js and MongoDB and with Express, by the way. So it's my general recommendation to follow along with that video. And uh, that's basically it for today. So thank you so much for being here, for participating, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.